Kelly Spencer, Carlo Fino Perro, uh, Legume David Rotti, and all the FTT School Canadical Institute of Stina Lada, and Simra Ineto, in Proti Dialix, in the program of Masiato Fino Perro, and as a Hola, Sa Anglica. Welcome to the Canadian Institute. Um, I'm the director, David Rupp, and uh, I'm very pleased to see you here. It's a nice crowd, different people, we, uh, we like that. Um, and uh, before introducing our speaker, I'd like to um, bring you to your attention, in case you don't know, uh, our program for the next almost every two weeks. You should be here every Wednesday at 7.30. Okay. It's very simple. Um, we have something for you. Each one, each of the lectures is going to be different and uh, interesting. Uh, on the first Wednesday, the first of November, we have uh, Professor Emily Barto, who is here in the audience, right there, um, uh, from the uh, uh, Housing University in the Maritimes. And she's going to be speaking on the politics of fatness in archaic Greece which is an interesting topic, which uh, we'll see whether it is politically correct or <laughs> just political. Um, but we're very interested in it. Uh, she's uh, here uh, for part of this hall, and we, we're always glad to have Canadian professors uh, come and give a lecture. So that is in two weeks' time. In a month's time, on Wednesday, November 15th, uh, Professor Nano Marinato, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Classics and Mediterranean Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago, who is well known for her work on Bronze Age uh, Greece, especially uh, religion uh, and uh, aquatiri, various topics relating to the, uh, uh, to the Cyclades and to Crete. Well, she's going to give a lecture on a topic that is very near and dear her heart but has nothing to do with the Bronze Age. It happens. And she is going to, her topic in the title of her lecture is Thucydides and Pericles, Dem uh, Democracy and Empire. Um, and uh, so she has an interesting, an interesting take on what we think we know so well. And we look forward to Nano's um, lecture on the uh, 15th. Then we're going to give you uh, three weeks. Uh, until the last lecture of the fall, uh, Professor Roger Fitzsimmons, um, Fitzsimmons from uh, the Department of Anthropology at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. He is uh, well known for what he has done uh, on Crete, especially the, um, uh, the Azoria project of the American School, Donald Haggis and uh, uh, Peggy Moop, uh, but as well as his work on uh, uh, Mycenaean monumental architecture. But he has another project, and he's going to tell us about that. And the title of his lecture is Taking a Seat at the Minoan Banquet, an Architectural Approach uh, to the Mineralization of the Aegean Islands. Um, and this is about Kea, uh, the site of Iron Rini, his research there. So that's on the 6th. Also on the 6th, we're going to start, as we always do, our last lecture of the fall, um, is the our Christmas holiday party. So, to speak. We'll have uh, uh, seasonal treats and uh, it'll get you going for the rest of the month. So those are the uh, uh, dates. We will I announce them, I announce them uh, with more detail in my blog on our website. And if you haven't, if you don't get our <coughs> announcement, uh, then uh, I'll see, put your email address against your name where you signed in and we'll put you on our mailing list. So, that is what's coming up every Wednesday from now on. And then we'll let you off for the holiday break. Um, I'm very pleased to, besides having a Canadian pre professor here, also an individual who is a member of our board of directors. Uh, we always like to have our board of directors come to Athens and see what we're doing in uh, Epitopo, and uh, also to um, uh, have a chance to get to know them better as well. So uh, Professor Sarah, uh, Sarah, Sabrina Higgins, who's our speaker for, uh, for 
this evening is a professor, uh, associate professor in um, the uh, um, Department of Phonetic Studies uh, at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, um, uh, near, near Vancouver, Burnaby, uh, British Columbia. Uh, she started out in Ottawa uh, getting her BA in Classics, specializing in Religious Studies at uh, the University of Ottawa. Then she went to uh, the University of British Columbia for MA in Classical Near Eastern Archaeology, and she finished up with her back to the uh, University of Ottawa for a PhD in Religious Studies. Her PhD thesis, I believe, is um, very similar to what we're hearing about tonight. Um, so that we're very interested in, in hearing about this. Um, it is um, not unusual, but let's say rare that we have uh, lectures here on a topic uh, relating to uh, uh, Byzantine, especially late Byzantine, and also to uh, um, uh, topics relating to the Virgin Mary, Marian studies, but I'm learning much more about this, and I understand she may be at the, uh, you can ask her at the uh, reception afterwards about a new project she's starting on uh, uh, Marian uh, studies. She comes to us, she has, I was, I had remembered, but then forgot, but now re-remembered, her field experience starts of the connection with, the, with our institute. Uh, she excavated at our a project that we had at, um, near Nemea, uh, the Aya Sotira Mycenaean Cemetery, and she was a, a digger there. Uh, she then went on, and this is uh, one of the uh, interesting things. After going to digging at Nemea, she then went on to Bulgaria for, for two projects in uh, Bulgaria, uh, military, Roman military fortress, um, and a, um, uh, the, the other one is your, the church, the church, the church. and so that uh, the 6th century uh, uh, basilica uh, in uh, 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 there, she was worked in Egypt and she's now uh, uh, participating in a, um, a project in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia uh, on a, a project that uh, Caroline Snively, I haven't seen Caroline in a long time, but uh, as somebody who is well known here in uh, Athens is directing along with a, a number of other colleagues. Uh, though she is a young scholar, she has already started to, uh, to publish uh, uh, on, various, uh, on various topics relating to her uh, dissertation as well as on, on uh, sculpture. So that she is giving papers, she is uh, uh, on a on a good path, and uh, we're very much interested in learning about the image of the Virgin, and we'll also see, um, I, I said to my wife, oh, it's Coptic, and she said, no, it isn't. So I will uh, be, I, I, will, I will be informed better after the lecture as to the difference, I would imagine, between Coptic and early uh, medieval Egypt. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I'd like to present Professor Higgins, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you for that, that kind introduction. Um, I, as uh, Dr. Rock mentioned, this is a bit of a spin-off of my dissertation. Uh, I spent the um, the last year putting together uh, this article, which I've turned into uh, a paper today. Uh, that deals with the third chapter of my dissertation. And what I was looking at in my, in my dissertation, and particularly now moving forward, um, is the relationship of our notion of cult um, to how cult manifests in the physical record. Um, and the thing that really inspired me was thinking about cult not just in terms of sort of from the top down, uh, but how is cult manifested amongst sort of popular culture? How do we see cult emerge? And to me, that came in the form of inscriptions um, of papyri mentioning cults of the Virgin Mary, um, churches, and of course images. And the images, I think, are the most sort of appropriate to give uh, as a as a public talk. So that's what I've chosen 
uh, today, and uh, that's what my, my next article is. So if you've got any objections or strong concerns, please let me know because I'm submitting this next week. <laughs> I need some time. So let's, uh, let's get started. So in the ruins of Egypt's uh, ancient churches, monasteries, and tombs, we occasionally come across traces of the wall paintings that would have once adorned these structures giving us a glimpse into the formerly thriving visual culture of Egyptian Christianity. While the dry climate and shifting desert sands have preserved a relatively large numbers, number of paintings from Christian Egypt, compared to, of course, elsewhere in the Mediterranean, they nevertheless represent a fraction of the images that once would have abounded the walls of Egypt. The survival of these paintings has encouraged the production of an immense body of literature. Until this point, however, studies have largely appeared in two distinct forms. The studies of particular iconographic themes, such as the Galactic Tufafusa, or the Nursing Virgin, or of a complete iconographic program at a specific location. For example, the Monastery of Appa Apollo at Balwit. While these studies have provided us with invaluable evidence about the corpus of images from late antique and early medieval Egypt, they've also paved the way for a third type of study, one which collects, catalogs, and analyzes the entire iconographic corpus of a particular saint and contextualizes those images within distinct spatial and temporal parameters. In adopting such a framework, it's then possible to situate the development of specific iconographic themes within their historical context, taking into account any apparent diachronic developments while also highlighting the unique spatial considerations for the placement of iconography across, uh, sorry, the, to, I can't really see. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this is, that's, thank you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> A little tiny light. Um, uh, well, also highlighting the unique spatial considerations for the placement of the, each of these images. As a result, this type of study traces the development of a saint's iconography across the long durée. Beginning with its initial introduction into the artistic corpus of a particular region, in this case, Egypt. With such a framework, moreover, the emerging visual culture can then be discussed relative to the theological undercurrents of the time period in question. So this, this paper then applies this approach to the iconography of the Virgin Mary to furnish a complete analysis of all the extant wall paintings, wall paintings in Egypt from the 3rd to the 11th century. The temporal parameters of this paper are dictated by two factors. One, the initial appearance of the first um, image of Mary in the 3rd century. And uh, finally, by the destruction of the churches and monasteries in the 11th century, particularly under the rule of, a rule of al-Hakim. Moreover, this broad diachronic framework bears witness to the intensive development and diversification of Marian iconography, much of which becomes prominent in the medieval period and beyond. A thorough study, of course, is impeded by the limited preservation of late antique buildings, including churches, domestic structures, funerary chapels, and to a lesser extent, as we'll see, monastic complexes. And Unfortunately, even in cases where structures are standing to a significant height, <coughs> their exposure to the element over the centuries, or as we all know, post-excavation, has caused large-scale de degradation to the paintings, and few entire iconographic programs have survived in the archaeological record. Thus, the analysis of the majority of the paintings collected for this project by, ne by necessity rely heavily on descriptions and, of course, photographs um, that were published in excavation reports. In total, I've collected 50 distinct images of Mary, but this is based on only what is undoubtedly a small part of the total number of Marian images that would have once adorned both religious and secular buildings of late antique and early middle, medieval Egypt. Although we're consequently left with just about a sample of these paintings, um, I hope today I can demonstrate that nonetheless, we can chronicle the elaboration of a visual culture associated with Mary in Egypt by first establishing a chronological framework for the appearance and subsequent development and elaboration of specific iconographic themes. And then the organization of the material in such a manner allows us then to more broadly contextualize this material 
um, by noting the changes within the imagery um, to any relevant sort of historical or contemporary texts that might have influenced their creation setting at the scene for a wider discussion of the cult of the Virgin Mary. By bridging the gap between the textual evidence and the iconography associated with her cult, this talk ultimately will argue that the visual culture of the Virgin Mary, at least in the wall paintings, did not coalesce until much later than we originally thought, that is the 6th or 7th century. I begin my discussion with the 3rd century first materialization of Mary in wall paintings. So the Western tomb at Kom al -Shul Khafa in southwest Alexandria bears the oldest representation of Mary's likeness on a wall painting in Egypt, although I dare you to try to find it in this image. <laughs> Traces of several saints adorned the center court of the tomb, which took the shape of a Latin cross. But the scene in question, this one here, was painted, painted in the western apse of the western Exedra, directly above a bench. Here, Mary serves as a peripheral character in a narrative phrase that highlights the miracles of Christ, particularly the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. An iconographic type which makes reference to the sacrament of the Eucharist in early Christian art. Such a scene is fitting more, moreover within this particular spatial context as it provides a visual reference to the Eucharist in a milieu where the Agape feast would have been celebrated. At the center of the painting stands Christ, flanked by twelve baskets of bread. He's approached on either side by the apostles Peter and Andrew, the latter of whom presents him with a plate of fish. Mary, on the other hand, is found to the left of the central scene, standing behind a group of four seated individuals who seemingly partake in this Agape feast. <coughs> Mary's participation in this scene is signaled by an inscription, which actually reads, I get Mata, they left it. I. Um, <clears throat> but her spectral presence otherwise lacks any identifying features. We would never know that was the Virgin Mary unless signaled by that inscription. Although she does not play a central role in this painting, nor is she afforded prominence of place, this image nevertheless marks her introduction into the corpus um, of Egyptian Christian art. This initial representation, however, is an outlier in our study. It represents the only extant painting of Mary before the 5th century, and the iconography is firmly rooted in the artistic tradition of the Roman catacombs. That's not, her, that's not to say, however, that her appearance in the scene in Egypt should be discounted, as it marks the starting point for the development of a distinct Marian iconography, most notably its use of a New Testament theme in the development of a visual culture for this emerging cult of Mary. The impetus for the development of iconographic themes in which Mary played an increasingly important <coughs> role is believed to have been tied to the theological development of the 5th fifth, fifth century. In particular, her declaration as Theotokos, or God-bearer, at the Council of Ephesus in 431. This proclamation was spurred on by the need to stress the interdependence of Christ and Mary in theological discourse through the, def through the definition of the true nature of Christ. It was her newly affirmed importance in the developing Christology, which eventually led to the creation of a distinct iconography, iconography for Mary, and the diversification of her image beyond simple reiterations of New Testament themes. One would expect, then, to encounter a surge in the production of Mary in imagery in the immediate aftermath of this council. Instead, we find a single painting of Mary in the 5th century which draws again exclusively from a New Testament <coughs> theme, that is, the Annunciation. Now, the iconography of the Annunciation represents the pictorial interpretation of Luke 1, 26-38, in which the archangel Gabriel announces the miraculous birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary. And in doing so, it creates a visual framework through which the believer can conceptualize the Incarnation and the Immaculate Conception. The image in question here, the single 5th century image, stems from the dome of the Chapel of Peace, a funerary chapel in the Albagawat necropolis in the Cargo Oasis, where it is surrounded, as you can see, by numerous disjointed scenes from both the Old 
and the New Testament, including Adam and Eve, as well as Paul and Tecla. In this instance, Mary stands in a gesture of prayer, while a dove approaches her from the right, with the message of the infant Jesus' impending birth. Both the theme and image, and its, uh, sorry, rather, both the theme of the image and its immediate context highlight the linear trend in the development of Marian iconography discussed thus far. The continued reliance on New Testament themes as artistic inspiration, even in the aftermath of Mary's declaration as Theotokos. So then we move to the 6th and 7th century. And these are arguably the most significant um, time for the creation and diffusion of Marian iconography. It represents a transitional period between the renderings of Mary in funerary art, which is what we've seen exclusively up to this point, and this bears a distinctive narrative component that closely resonates with the artistic tradition of the Roman catacombs. Shifting to the artistic conceptualization of Mary, finally, as the Theotokos. That is, a visual culture for Mary which is increasingly didactic and relies less on explicit pictorial translations of New Testament themes. In addition, this period marks the first instance within the Egyptian wall paintings that Mary is portrayed as an enthroned virgin. Thus, this period denotes the diversification of Marian art, particularly in terms of the creation of new iconographies and the application of these images to varying spaces in which funerary contexts continue to play a role. These changes are best exemplified uh, sorry, that up, um, by the 6th or 7th century painting from the crypt at Qom Abu Girga, southeast of Alexandria. And it marks the last extant image of Mary within a funerary context. And you can just see her at the end there, sort of enthroned in a bit of her head. In this instance, we encounter a second iteration of the Annunciation, which employs the, the narrative structure typical of funerary art, while also incorporating elements associated with contemporary efforts of our <coughs> Notably, this version of the Annunciation more accurately reflects the narrative of Luke through its use, well, first of all, as Gabriel as the divine messenger. However, it varies from the earlier manifestation of the scene that we just mentioned by rendering Mary enthroned. As such, it represents a turning point in the visual conception of Mary, whereby New, Test where, whereby New Testament themes are adapted to reflect the changing ways in which Mary is artistically conceived. In this vein, we encounter a shift towards the creation of more abstract allusions to these narratives which incorporate the recently outlined theological and liturgical developments, while also drawing inspiration from the Apocrypha and the artistic convention of the enthroned mother, which was, of course, a common element in many ancient representations of women, especially goddesses and in Paleo-Christian funerary art. Throughout the 6th and 7th centuries, therefore, we see the gradual introduction of new iconographies which build on the conceptualization of Mary as the Theotokos by introducing visual clues that signal to Mary's importance within the emerging Christology. For instance, the near-complete shift to the representation of Mary now as an enthroned virgin. This period also sees the creation of several new iconographic themes, both biblical and extra-biblical in their inspiration, in which Mary now takes a central role, no longer is she relegated to the periphery. In Egyptian monastic art, we can distinguish five new themes that emerge in the 6th and 7th centuries, which I've outlined here. The double compositions, the enthroned Mary and child in its single tier compositions, the Galacto Trefusa, enthroned virgin without child, and what I deemed miscellaneous Marian themes, well, because they only appear once. Of these, the double composition is by far the most prevalent of these iconographic themes characteristically appearing in modest monastic settings, particularly in the eastern apse behind the altar in prayer rooms and small churches. Typically, we find an enthroned Christ within a mandala in the upper zone, while Mary and or the apostles, uh, sorry, and the apostles and or like local saints appear in the lower zone. Now, while the general organization of the upper zone 
and lower remain relatively consistent, there are things which vary um, amongst all of these images. In the upper zone, for instance, you can have the presence or absence of the creatures of the apocalypse. The sun and the moon appear varyingly, as do angels. And the arrangement of the virgin and child in the lower zone might be accompanied by figures, or they may appear by themselves. There's a marked disparity among scholars, however, as to what these double compositions actually mean. For some, notably, notably DeWalt, these scenes are representations of the Ascension, which reflect the narratives in the canonical Gospels of Mark, Luke, and the Acts of the Apostles, as well as the Apocryphal Gospel of Nicodemus, while other people have argued that they represent theophanic visions, in which Christ is depicted in majesty at his second coming, announced at the moment of the Ascension. Osiskawa, on the other hand, has argued for a greater connection with the liturgy, suggesting that the image represents the deesis, that is, Mary and John interceding before God, where the interceding Christ appears as Maestas Domini in the upper register. Obviously, we have no idea what's going on here. But so, as a result, for the most part, scholars have avoided these all-encompassing terms, arguing that there's little evidence that either the liturgy or the Feast of the Ascension had monumental bearing on the iconography of these double compositions. Instead, we have to recognize the presence of several complex representations of different gospels and apocryphal narratives, which embody distinctly Egyptian beliefs, practices, and traditions. Thus, we must opt for what we're going to term a pluridimensional approach of the double, or interpretation of these compositions, which recognizes the continuing action of Christ, while also engaging with the paradox that exists in the figure of Christ, who both takes of his mother's breast and reigns over heaven and earth. The difficulty of categorizing these uh, and assigning meaning to these images is further illustrated um, when we discuss the lower tiers, because we can subdivide them into three distinct types where you have Mary in a medallion in the lower tier, where she's enthroned with child, or where she's as an, appearing as an orant. Now there are 11 of these double compositions that we find in the 6th and 7th century, all of which stem from two monasteries, the Monastery of Apa Palo at Bawit and the Monastery of Apa Jeremiah at Saqqara. At the outset, these images are exclusively found in monastic cells and small chapels and are spatially limited to the eastern prayer niche or the eastern wall of these rooms. That is really the direction in which the monks would have played, uh, prayed. But despite the close physical proximity of these paintings to one another and their restriction to two excavated monasteries, there are immense variabilities in the way in which they're executed. The first type, Mary within a medallion, appears only once. In a sixth or seventh century uh, chapel, uh, Chapel B at Saqqara. Mary is most frequently depicted, however, in the second type, enthroned with child, of which we have eight instances. And each is unique in its design and configuration. This di diversity is best illustrated by these two images from Saqqara. In cell F, the first one, Mary holds the child in her left lap. She's flanked by the archangels Gabriel and Michael, as well as six local saints, one of whom is a woman. In contrast, cell 1723 shows an enthroned Mary holding a beardless, beardless Christ in a clopeus. And she's flanked only by the two archangels. That's a terrible picture. <laughs> That's the, the only picture we have of this, unfortunately. But imagine two angels on the side. <laughs> the third type of double composition, Mary Oran's, um, can be differentiated, uh, or sorry, another significant variation within this iconography appears at um, Chapel 42 at the Monastery of Apollo at Bawit, where we encounter the enthroned Mary as Galactotrophusa. So you still have Mary enthroned sitting with child, but here she's breastfeeding him, whereas in the other she was simply holding him. The third type of double composition is seen here, Mary Orans. And it's differentiated by this gesture of prayer in which she's engaged, and the absence of the infant Jesus in the lower tier. There are only two extant examples of this type, of which, these are, of which this is one. 
both of them stemming from the monastery of Apa Apollo at Bawit. Both, uh, both images uh, depict Mary alongside the apostles, uh, an element of the iconography which is not consistent anywhere else. It is only in these Oran's images where it's strictly the 12 apostles. Um, everywhere else, who's standing next to Mary varies considerably. Thus, this marked disparity and lack of uniformity in the way in which all of these images are structured reinforces that difficulty I spoke about in assigning meaning to these particular themes, whether that be the ascension, Christ in majesty, etc., to the devil compositions, which is why I've adopted this broadly, uh, this broad term um, so to reflect the diversity of these images. So I argue that we have to abandon strict iconography iconographic typologies and opt for an interpretation of these compositions that does not separate Christ's ascension from his continuing action, which defies both space and time. And such an approach is especially pertinent given the uniqueness of each of them, all of which draw from different elements of the Old and New Testament, the Apocrypha, the liturgy, hymns, and patristic writings to create a completely unique rendering of the scene. The 6th and 7th centuries also bear witness the emergence of single-tiered manifestations of the enthroned virgin and child, of which there are ten representations. Whereas the devil compositions offer this multifaceted reading uh, of the scene that encompasses uh, aspects of Christ's ascension and second, uh, and second coming, the single-tiered compositions specifically highlight Mary's role as Theotokos, def as defined by the Council of Ephesus. Here, Mary assumes a Christological in which she highlights Christ's divinity and, when flanked by the archangels, acts as a metaphor for the Eucharist. As such, the imagery intentionally focuses on the interdependence of Mary and the infant Jesus, who's placed on her lap. And there are two iterations of this theme. In the first, the pair is rendered independent of subsidiary figures, while in the second, they're flanked by archangels and Although their images are uniquely Christian in their meaning, we can again nevertheless draw parallels to Egyptian, Greco-Roman, Near Eastern, and European images of the enthroned uh, goddess, or enthroned mother goddess. Uh, we have many of those. The earliest depiction of Mary in a single-tiered painting comes from the 6th century domestic context, the courtyard of House D at Qam Abu Dib in Alexandria. Now, following this first appearance, the type is almost exclusively preserved in monastic contexts, with the exception of its depiction here in the church in the Isis temple at Aswan, which dates more broadly to the 6th to 9th century. In comparison with the double compositions, however, these images display a greater fluidity in their configuration and a much wider geographical reach. As they appear in both domestic and ecclesiastical structures ranging as far north as Alexandria and as far south as Aswan. In addition, these images are not limited to the apses and niches of monastic cells, and we see a movement towards incorporating Mary as Theotokos into the more generalized iconographic program of ecclesiastical buildings, where, for example, she appears uh, on the pillar, this pillar here, on the church in the Isis temple right in the nave of the church. Thus, at least for this particular image, we can say that there's a much more diverse use rather than a purely monastic one, as we saw with the double compositions. The 6th and 7th centuries also see the introduction of this variant, which I briefly mentioned, which is the Galacto Trifusa. This particular iconography depicts an enthroned Mary with Jesus seated on her right knee, offering her right breast with her left hand. Furthermore, Mary is typically portrayed as hieratic, with little to no visual interaction with her child. No, she's always staring forward. From the beginning, the Galatians <coughs> images appear exclusively in monastic contexts, and they're most commonly found, again, in the, these eastern wall niches of monk cells, of which there are five extant examples. Um, three from Saqqara and two from Bawit. The Virgin and Child appear alone in this painting here from Bawit, whereas other images depict them centrally amongst varying saints. And here, she looks like she's alone, 
um, the sides of the niches that are, that are the two archangels. Despite the iconographic differences, each image draws upon or draws upon shared ritual significance within the context of the cell. That is again their placement in the eastern niche towards which the monks would have prayed. Aside from the uh, aside from the examples preserved in monastic cells, there is a single surviving painting of the Galactotrophusa in the northern semi-dome of the church of Anbabishai in the so-called Red Monastery at Sohag, that is right in the central church. This painting is more securely dated to the second half of the 6th century, and it marks the first instance in which the Virgin is monumentalized in Egyptian wall painting. The Virgin and Child occupy the center of the scene, flanked by the four prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Daniel. Two elaborate arches frame these prophets, each pier bearing a representation of four additional men, identified by inscriptions as Elijah the Tishbite, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, and Moses the Lawgiver. In the upper register of the semi-dome, Joseph and Salome, who we get from the apocryphal narratives, uh, flank uh, Michael and Gabriel, who are the two angels there in the center. Despite the obvious difference in place and composition, in every instance, the physical act of nursing is downplayed as much as possible. Mary is always fully clothed, except for a single exposed breast, which is highly stylized and barely visible. Her virginity and modesty are highlighted in every aspect of her iconography. The Christological implications of these paintings are contrasted with another potential iconographic variant to emerge in the 6th and 7th centuries, that is, the enthroned virgin without child. A discussion of this iconography is rendered a little bit difficult, however, because there's a complete lack of surviving pictorial evidence. But um, our knowledge of these two images come from early 20th century reports in which we have um, the excavators noting that they have um, potentially images of Mary. So the first one stems from Chapel 8 at the Monastery of Apollo at Balwit, but its fragmented state left Pleda, the excavator, unable to discern whether it depicted the Virgin or Christ. The second painting is from a niche in cell 1724, of which he notes only the figures of the Virgin, Enoch, and Jeremiah, and the two archangels could be discerned. While the classification of these images as a separate category is, of course, tangential and depends on accurate descriptions and our belief in these descriptions of already fragmented images, they nevertheless raise an interesting question as to the potential function of such images where Mary appears without Christ. By appearing without the child, Mary would no longer assume her Christological role as Theotokos, but become an intercessor for the Christian community. The absence of Christ permits the viewer to interact directly with her, allowing for an increasingly personal relationship. As the tendency to portray Mary becomes more prolific in the 6th and 7th centuries, so too does her inclusion in narrative friezes that abound the walls of churches and monasteries. While several individual themes uh, within these narrative scenes certainly appear earlier, like the Annunciation, the long-form narrative component and Mary's inclusion in it uh, marks a distinct first within the corpus of Marian art. These cycles, however, are notably difficult to characterize as they draw on both canonical and apocryphal gospels, particularly the Proto-Evangelium of James. And the friezes are inconsistent in their organization. So we have to rely on their overall arrangement to determine the central theme of these narratives. Nevertheless, narrative friezes featuring the Virgin generally fall under one of two categories, cycles of the infancy of Christ or the life of Mary. These uh, infancy of Christ cycles are best exemplified by the fragmented remains of a narrative frieze on the south wall of the nave at Karm al Bahia. This cycle um, depicts the Annunciation, the Visitation, or the Ordeal of Bitter Water, the adoration of the Magi, the massacre of the innocents, and the flight into Egypt. The figure of Mary is seemingly repeated three times in the scene. Beginning on the left, we see the head of the Virgin in the Annunciation scene, 
um, followed by an enthroned figure, which is probably Mary, correlating to the adoration of the Magi. And towards the end of the sequence, Mary sits on the back of a donkey as they came to Egypt. At the monastery of Apo Apollo at Bowie, again, I apologize for the quality of that picture, uh, but we get a similar cycle of the life, um, the life of Christ, the infancy of Christ, which appears on the north wall of room 7 in building 1. And uh, <coughs> so you can see the kind of things that we're dealing with a lot of the time in terms of these images. Um, but again, it appears on the, um, on the north wall uh, of building 1, a space which is typically identified as part of a hostile complex. So we're dealing with a monastery, a hostile complex that has this type of scene here. Unfortunately, the beginning of the scene is lost, but it likely began with the Annunciation and the Visitation, two common themes that typically start off these friezes, um, followed by the extant sections which illustrate the apparition to Joseph, so Joseph getting the dream, the voyage to Bethlehem, and you can see a bit of a donkey here, and trust me, there are two little tiny red feet there, that's Mary. <laughs> There's the nativity over here, where Mary's reclining on the couch, you can see her in the purple, and over here she's enthroned with child as the Magi approach. Several of the same images, however, are used to convey a completely different narrative. That is the life of Mary on a different chapel, Chapel 61, uh, which is a communi community oratory uh, or reception room also at Bawit. Um, here again, we encounter uh, the Annunciation and the Visitation, which are often, or which are then followed by, see about the Annunciation, uh, the Visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt, and the final scene is uh, often called the Nativity, but not actually the Nativity because we're missing the child Christ, and you've got Salome, who's a referenced only in the apocryphal documents as the woman who checks to see if Mary's still a virgin, and her hand triples. Um, because she didn't believe her, uh, which is part of the apocryphal proto-evangelium of James. So the emphasis here laid on the Virgin and its use of the apocryphal stories um, distinguishes this particular cycle um, from those in Route 7 and that at Karm al Bayra, which highlight Christ as their principal character and draw chiefly from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. But despite the diverging textual uh, inspirations and narrative focuses, all is illustrate sequential events that were well understood and recognized by the individuals who might enter the communal spaces in which they were located. In addition to the aforementioned examples, there's a fourth narrative freeze that I want to draw your attention to, which survives in the narthex, um, so the outer uh, sort of entryway uh, of the quarry church at Deir Abu Hinnis. These paintings, which are generally dated to the 6th to 8th century, spread across two walls of the narthex. They begin with the massacre of the innocents over here, followed by the supplication of Zacharias, Gabriel's apparition to Joseph, and the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt. Mary appears exclusively in the final scene here on the back of the donkey. Here, she and the infant, Jesus, um, flee as Joseph walks behind them. Now, initially, this frieze was identified as a scene from the infancy of Christ, although this is not a typical structure for an infancy cycle. But more recently, we've determined that this is, in fact, the infancy scene um, or life of John the Baptist, to whom the church was dedicated. Now, while, cycle, while such a cycle is unusual in the corpus of Christian art in Egypt, Mary's inclusion in this narrative is not surprising, as the life of Christ and John the Baptist were intimately intertwined. Now, the diversity of the compositions in which Mary appears is further reflected in the diverging spaces that each occupies within its structural environments, although it must be noted that all appear in monastic context. Of those discussed, only the infancy cycle at Qom al Abaria is located within the nave of a church and it represents the only narrative cycle preserved within a liturgical space in Egypt. The remaining friezes are situated in rooms with non-liturgical functions, to which a broad spectrum of individuals could be admitted, including the narthex, or visitor's room, um, a chapel, 
uh, sorry, at Darrow McInnes, as well as the community oratory or reception room um, and hostel complexes at Bawit. Spaces that allowed for the creation of a visual culture that offered both instruction and opportunities for contemplation. The 6th and 7th centuries, therefore, represent a period of creativity within the developing visual culture in which artists could explore the different ways to render the Virgin. And this is again further illustrated by several murals that are not bound by iconographic classification as they display significant diversity in both style and overall composition, what I deem miscellaneous here. Uh, I'm going to only speak about one, uh, and that is this next one here, um, the wedding of <coughs> from Dara Buchanis, which uh, is broadly dated to the 6th to 8th centuries. Now, in this uh, painting, Mary acts as a witness to the wedding at Cana, standing at the outer left edge, um, I guess here, the other side, um, of the composition. As Christ, to her proper left, proper left, changes water into wine. And then there are three additional figures, including a woman at the far right. Now, while this theme is not unique to the corpus of Egyptian art, uh, or Christian art at all, um, it actually represents the only extant image in which Mary's preserved in the wedding at Cana uh, in Egypt. So, summing up this, this particular period, I want to just note that the diversity in composition and theme within these paintings reflect a wider trend that emerges in the 6th and 7th century. The exploration of the available source material, the canonical gospels, apocryphal texts, and existing iconographies to create a distinct visual culture for the Virgin Mary. It marks a time of extraordinary profusion of Marian imagery, in which specific ideas and iconographic components begin to emerge and which will be expounded and elaborated upon in the centuries to follow. Nevertheless, we continue to encounter the visual uh, translations of biblical narratives in this period, although there's a definitive shift towards highlighting Mary's Christological function, particularly her portrayal as an enthroned mother with a child. It's also a time when Mary starts to become an interest in her own right. For example, these uh, prepartum narrative themes, a trend that has proliferated in the following centuries. Now, while there's a uh, concerted effort to create and develop distinct Marian iconographies in the 6th and 7th centuries, the 8th and 9th are characterized by the elaboration of these images into increasingly formulaic renderings, which would shape the way in which they were translated into the visual culture of the medieval period. Moreover, there's a greater trend towards the more prominent incorporation into the iconographic programs of monastic and non-monastic churches, not just cells and small chapels, eventually finding prominence of place within the overall decorative scheme, particularly the more prolific inclusion of Mary into the nave of the church, the heart of the church. This development is particularly well illustrated through an analysis of the iconographic program at the Church of the Theotokos, Theotokos at Dera Serian, which is formerly known as the Monastery of the Holy Virgin at Der Emma Bishoy. This church was founded in the 6th century after a theological dispute over the human nature of Christ and the role of the Virgin as his physical mother. And this split the monastic community at Der Emma Bishoy in two. Those who described the Orthodox view left the monastery and founded a new community close by. And to underscore their theological convictions that led, um, that led to the establishment of this new settlement, both church and monastery were dedicated to the Virgin. Thus, given the historical context in which this monastery came to exist, it's unsurprising, I guess, that images of the Virgin materialize on several progressive layers of the name of this monastic church. The early of this, the earliest of these is a painting of the Galacto Trifusa, again, the nursing virgin, uh, which appears on a half column in the Curus and dates to circa 700. The position of this image, though, is exceptional. It occupies a space in which we would traditionally expect to find a painting or icon of Christ. That is, to the right of the entrance to the Haikal, but more importantly, the chorus, 
here might also have been the original Haikal, the original screen uh, of the church, part of a trilobe sanctuary similar to that we're seeing at Sohab, perhaps directly linking the image with the altar. After the completion of the Galactosrefusa, at least two additional representations of the Virgin were added to the decorative program. These images, likely dated to the 8th century, include an epiphany in uh, the northern semi-dome and uh, the Annunciation uh, in the uh, northern semi-dome of the of the Kudus. In the western return aisle of the, uh, sorry, that one's in the western return aisle of the name. So two paintings, these two paintings appear to be part of a larger cycle that would um, have extended to the southern semi-dome of the chorus and perhaps the eastern conch of the church itself, although the existence of this conch remains speculative. This theorized eastern conch would have likely contained an ascension scene, so it follows that the Pentecost would have followed on the northern semi-dome. And if these estimations are indeed correct, the church at Der Surian probably contained a complete Christological cycle from conception to resurrection in which Mary featured prominently. Such a program is markedly different from the freezes that manifested in the 6th and 7th centuries as we transition from narrative conceptualization of the infancy to the visualization of the liturgy and Mary's importance within it. Most importantly, we note the attempts to draw connections between ritual and space, tying the physical performance of the liturgy with the placement of the iconography in each of these semidomes. A further example of this diversification uh, is epitomized by this 8th or 9th century mural on the eastern wall of Chapel 59 at Bawit. But it doesn't look like much because, unfortunately, the only image that's preserved has a, um, a, a light mark right down the middle. Um, but I'll try to describe it as best as possible. So here you have a centrally enthroned adult Christ who holds a book in his lap with his left hand and gives the sign of benediction to his right. And he sits next to Mary, and they're flanked by ten individuals. The pair is enthroned on an elevated platform, which you can see a little bit at the bottom. Um, and two seated individuals sit directly uh, next to Christ. Everyone else, the other eight individuals, are all standing. In this painting, though, Mary and Christ are treated as equals. Both are enthroned, occupying a central position, and they're rendered at a nearly identical height. And it represents the first instance in which the adult Christ and Mary are depicted <coughs> together on the same plane, outside of a strictly biblical context, for example, the wedding at Cana. All other occurrences of the adult Christ and Mary are limited to double compositions, in which the figure of Christ is restricted to the upper zone, implying a cosmological separation between them. Christ in heaven, Mary on earth. Thus, these 8th and 9th century images mark the point at which the earlier themes are solidified and expounded, while also leaving room for uh, continued diversification, especially as the Virgin's Christological function becomes increasingly pronounced in the visual culture of Christian Egypt. We see also a notable increase in Mary's broader incorporation into the iconographical programs of larger churches, which begins in the 6th century, but is epitomized by Mary's prominent inclusion in the decorative scheme at Deros Vian. While of course we must reflect on the theological disputes that ultimately led to the foundation of Deros Vian, uh, and inform its emphasis on Marian iconography, this period nevertheless sets the stage for the further inclusion of Mary um, into the iconography of churches in the following centuries, when it becomes further, uh, firmly incorporated into the decorative scheme of Egyptian churches. As we move to the 10th and 11th centuries, finally, there is a greater propensity to illustrate scenes from the life of the Virgin within Egyptian churches. And it also marks the first time, perhaps ever, that, uh, in which the liturgy pertaining to the death of the Virgin is visualized in the extant wall paintings, reflecting the emerging importance of this theme within the canon of Egyptian church decoration and Byzantine church decoration. And this is best exemplified by this sequence of paintings from, again, Dero Surian from the 10th century, 
which illustrate her dormit, uh, dormition, unification, and assumption of the Virgin Mary. The series is found on the eastern wall of the Chorus and is separated into three different scenes. At the far left, we encounter a representation of the Dormition, perhaps the earliest extant example of this being known today, in which the Virgin is lying on a bed, surrounded by twelve apostles and six women, the latter of whom are swinging censers, a role that is typically reserved for men. A large winged figure stands behind the bed, probably the Archangel Michael, with his arms stretched out as if to receive the soul of the Virgin. And the uniqueness of this image extends even to the center scene, the central scene, for which there's no analogous representation in the contemporary corpus of Christian art. Here, the Virgin sits to the proper right of Christ, both enthroned as he raises her left arm in a gesture of triumph. We may interpret this uh, as the reunification of the, uh, the Virgin's body and soul in heaven and its reception by Christ. And the sequence concludes at the far, um, at the far right um, with a scene that is largely missing, but the surviving elements suggest that it once illustrated the assumption of the Virgin. Particularly, you've got the group of men who are looking up in wonder, as well as a partial Coptic inscription which reads, Pisoma, the body of. In addition to the novel depictions of the Virgin in the Chorus, right, this sort of prominent place in the center of the church, at Dera Surian, you have a double composition that was added to the southern wall of the nave. And it belongs to a set of commemorative paintings for Abbot Makati, who died in 889. And these spread across the southeast corner of the church, an area which was designed, redesigned as a funerary chapel. In this painting, we find Christ in the upper zone, this one up here, surrounded by the four creatures of the apocalypse, while the lower tier depicts an enthroned Mary and child, flanked again by the apostles Peter and Paul. While this particular composition generally adheres to the earlier renderings that we spoke of, two unique variants of the double composition are found elsewhere in the 10th and 11th centuries, particularly in a rock-hewn cave from Dera Bunakar, and in the western apse of the North Church at Kubid al Hawa. In the first instance, unfortunately I don't have a picture. Oh, you know what? Maybe I did find one. I did. Uh, uh, in the first instance, the painting near Dera Bumata was found on the east wall of what was likely a prayer room. We're referring to this one here. Um, here, the typically stratified double composition deviates from a traditional schema and appears instead on a single plane. So you've got Mary here, and you can see just cut off uh, Christ in a mandala. Uh, so this, this idea of the double composition being split onto a single plane. Um, probably on account of the low ceiling, they ran out of room. <laughs> it preserves a fragmentary image of Christ in majesty, surrounded by the four creatures of the apocalypse, followed by representation of the Galactic Trafusa between two arch archangels on her right. So again, you can see this uh, stylized breast of the Virgin. The double composition at Kubid al Hawa, on the other hand, is notable for its distinct arrangement in the upper zone, this one over here, whereby the bust of Christ appears in a mandala, which is carried by six angels instead of the typical four. In the lower tier, the Virgin again assumes this position of Arant in the center of the composition, flanked strictly by the twelve apostles, which is always consistent in the rendering of the scene. A slightly later date is considered uh, for this painting, perhaps uh, up to the early 12th. Um, although a graffito oops, that cuts through the hand of the Virgin at least gives us a terminus antiquam of 1125. Apart from its iconographic intrigue, moreover, the location of this image in the western apse of the church bears mentioning, as double compositions are typically found in the eastern semi-domes of churches given their intimate association with the, uh, with the liturgy of Christ's resurrection. The discussion of the 12th, uh, 10th, and 11th century wall paintings concludes finally with a representation of the Virgin on a pillar in the nave of the church at Karm al Kubiana. Here, an unidentified saint stands <coughs> to the left of the Virgin, who's also standing, and she carries a child in her left arm and gestures towards him with her right hand. 
Although the image is fragmentary, the Virgin seemingly assumes the guise of the Hodigetria, she who points the way, marking a rare extant example of this image in Egypt. Its integration to the nave, however, suggests that the monks and laymen alike may have recognized or acknowledged the symbolism embedded with these type, although we have very few uh, images of the type preserved. And, or sorry, or that at least they engaged with the image within the structural confines of the church, ultimately signifying that this iconographic type existed and was understood outside of Byzantium, where it occurred with some frequency. Now, while the surviving 50 representations, representations of Mary, of which I showed you a selection, represent only a fraction of the number of paintings that would have adorned the walls of structures across Egypt until the 11th century, they nevertheless facilitate a discussion of the expression and development of Marian iconography. I want to highlight that at the outset, depictions of Mary are exclusively limited to her role within the New Testament. For example, the third century painting of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. It was only the declaration of Mary as Theotokos at the Council of Ephesus that provided the impetus for the development of a Marian iconography, which looked beyond the simple iterations of gospel themes. While these, not, uh, while these narratives are by no means absent from later Marian iconography throughout the periods in question, they do, albeit, appear in notably different forms, for instance, the wedding at Cana. And again, we have to remember that only in the 5th century we get one image after um, the Council of Ephesus. And so it's not until the 6th and 7th centuries, where I spent a substantial amount of time today, that artists begin to earnestly generate an ever-expanding artistic database, which specifically explores Mary's role as Theotokos within the Christological framework, particularly the propensity to illustrate her as an enthroned virgin with child. This diaconic gap suggests that it took some time for the Mariology expounded at the Council of Ephesus to manifest itself into a distinct visual culture for Mary. And moreover, the extant evidence suggests that monastic communities played an essential role in its development, as the impetus seems to appear at the outset for monastic cells. Although, of course, we have to take into account the, the preservation bias, of course. But from the 8th century onwards, there's a notable diversification and elaboration of Marian iconography, and an interest in its incorporation into the larger iconographic programs of churches culminating in the widespread inclusion of the Virgin in the decoration of the naves of churches in the 10th and 11th century. Finally, the wealth of information that's derived from a chronological analysis of Marian wall paintings provides a clear direction and opportunities for future studies, particularly analyses that would investigate the development of Marian iconography across other media, including illuminated manuscripts, liturgical <coughs> equipment, and the small arts. Such studies would nuance the picture that emerged from the investigation of these paintings, further illustrating, or further interrogating the point at which the visual culture associated with the Virgin Mary <coughs> coalesced, the current evidence for which suggests it only occurred in the 6th and 7th centuries. Thank you. Questions, comments, um, interjections for the uh, before the uh, paper goes to press. Um, I have one that is, um, I'm not sure whether you can answer it. Is um, this pattern that you um, um, one line for us? Is this unique to Egypt, or can we see it in Palestine and other places in the Eastern Mediterranean? Is it um, uh, something that uh, certainly the Council of Ephesus? plays a role here, but in this particular way. In terms of this type of research, it, it's never really been done, which is what inspired me to do it. Um, you've got a lot of things that have been particularly written about the Theodore in Byzantium, but none that's sort of taken it from a chronological approach, which is what sort of this project you alluded to is about, is looking at the chronology of the material from, um, from Syria, uh, from Egypt and from Byzantium to see if this is actually emerging. So the next project <laughs> touches okay. on Byzantium and Syria. Oh, right. um, but generally, I, I assume it would be fairly similar. We get very little. I mean, Nikki, you're the expert. 
I, I, am. I would like to thank you very much for this extremely interesting uh, paper, which uh, really turns the page in Marian studies, bringing to our attention, you know, material that we never knew before, and uh, which really needs to be studied thoroughly in order to reconsider the emergence of, uh, of Marian cult. I think that your research has been. Uh, it is, I mean, uh, extremely, extremely important in the reconsideration of the emergence of, uh, of Marian cult. Uh, thank you very, very much for all this. I, I just have one question to, to ask you, whether you have uh, uh, studied the, the, the examples that you showed us, especially the, the mother of God, which is uh, extremely prominent in uh, in your study, uh, with reference to earlier examples of pieces, uh, I have. Uh, yes, yeah. of course you have. I have. So, um, yes, I was talking about it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you for highlighting my article. <laughs> um, I, I did. I wrote an article on um, the the relationship between Isis and Mary, um, and looking at notions of the Galactus Refusa and how one influenced or, or did not influence the other. Um, and sort of my personal belief on the matter is that um, while you've got this long line of cults from from Mutch, from Isis, from Kaidili, who are all enthroned mothers with children, um, that the Coptic, uh, you know, the Egyptian Galactus obviously bears different meanings, as you know, similar with the Byzantine, uh, Byzantine models as well. Um, that we need, to, we need to study them in a Christian context. But what's fascinating about this link that we often jump to, particularly with Isis and Mary, is that the last representation of Isis, lactans, Isis breast, breastfeeding, occurs in the 4th century. And the first one of Mary occurs very likely in the late 6th or early 7th. And the link between the two is actually funerary art. So you get the continuation of um, breastfeeding mothers on stele, um, not necessarily in religious um, Other comments? Yes, in the back. Uh, I have a question related to David's actually, but kind of going the other direction. Um, do you see regional patterns within Egypt, within the kind of corpus of, uh, of places that you're looking at? And what's the spatial distribution like? Are we sort of all over the place We're all in over Egypt? The place. So by the 6th century, you've got a cult of Mary that exists in Aswan. Um, probably. Late 6th. Um, the one lacuna in my research right now is Alexandria. Um, so while we've got the, the two funerary contexts from Alexandria, there's almost nothing. Um, and I deliberately left out literary evidence that comes from much later sources. We're talking about churches that exist in the 3rd or 4th century to Mary, um, or even 5th or 6th, but they're written often 8th, 9th, 12th. And so I don't take that as, as evidence. What I was using, though, was uh, papyrological material and epigraphy. And so when I found papyri that mentioned the Church of the Virgin, and we have a date for that, then I was using that. Um, so, I mean, we assume it's starting in Alexandria and spreading outwards. So that's the one thing that this whole study is missing, is Alexandria. Um, if there's a cache of papyri from Alexandria somewhere, let me know. Um, let me know if I'm missing something, but no, I assume it spreads out from there, um, but it spreads very quickly down the Nile, but you can't seem to trace it because unfortunately a lot of these paintings, especially from Saqqara and Bawit, um, are now gone and they were excavated in the early 20th century and they're all dated sort of very tangentially um, based on iconographic conventions that are very, very broad, so it, it's problematic. Other questions, comments? Yes. Well, this is kind of complete ignorance, but I was fascinated by the fact that you have all these images of Mary in the monk's cells. Mm -hmm. Is that typical to have monk cells actually, uh, instead of an icon, they, they have a painting? Or yeah, you don't get a lot of icons in early Christian Egypt. Okay. Um, so it's a very sort of different development than Byzantium. Um, and I mean, you don't get, besides the icon at Sinai, and I actually exclude the Sinai because it's much more like Byzantium than it is Egypt, <laughs> so I just leave it alone. <laughs> leave it for everyone else. Um, so yeah, you don't really get them. So you get more, more wall paintings. Um, and what you do have is you've got, uh, you've got uh, 
the high call, the separation of the wall in which you would get these paintings. Okay, so it's, so it's <coughs> different. Like anybody has a mural of Mary, it's, it's actually in specific It's in a specific yeah. place for a specific reason, rather okay. than having an icon. Okay. Or if you do have an icon, because monks are coming from all over the place, right. you still do have some kind of image. And that's a project way down the line that I tried to start, but <laughs> I've said yes to too many other things, um, is actually looking and cataloging all of the Eastern wall niches in Egypt um, to see who's being represented how frequently. And from what I've seen so far, it's almost exclusively Christ and Mary in the Eastern wall niches of, of the Christian monk cells. Yes. I'm curious about where the impetus for iconographic development or change comes from. Do you think there's an element of artistic freedom in there? Is that kind of an artist rendering? If there is a connection to you know, major theological councils, is it coming from the monastic community? Is it coming from patrons? I think it's all of the above. Okay. I think that it's not, it's certainly, um, I mean, the Council of Ephesus, I, when I was embarking on this project, I thought it would have a much more significant immediate impact, but we don't see it at all. Um, so what I think is that people are trying to figure out what this means and how to now display Mary. Um, but in terms of where it's coming from, it could be, it could be Byzantium. Unfortunately, there's not much left from that time. You get a lot of mention of icons, uh, but the types of icons that are developing in the 6th and 7th century that type doesn't necessarily appear in Egypt. Um, so, and then you've got a lot of Syrians moving in, so you, you've got Syrian influences as well. Um, so I think it's coming from everywhere, and a lot of it is probably um, drawing parallels from female goddess representations and, and making them Christian and, and adapting the theology to that. So I think it, yeah, it comes from all kinds of places. <laughs> One last question. Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sabrina. That extraordinarily interesting uh, talk and I think it corroborates very well the idea or the view that has increasingly come to prevail that the Council of Ephesus said nothing about Theotokos and that the idea that they spoke about Theotokos was based on a misunderstanding in the Council of 553 of what they thought the Council of Ephesus had said, but in fact the acts of the Council of Ephesus have, are preserved entirely and make no mention of the Theotokos. And so it's only after the Council in 553 that the Theotokos is the Theotokos. And, and so that would explain very nicely why you don't find the um, iconography of the Theotokos with the Christ enthroned in, in the version of that yes. until the late 6th century. Mm -hmm. Indeed, you would then see a, a direct response yeah, to, that, to that later council. Absolutely. And because what the, the problem seems to have been that the Council of Ephesus read two of St. Cyril's letters, um, uh, which made no mention of the Theotokos. But there is a third letter of St. Cyril that the Council of 553 thought had been read, which does make mention of Theotokos, and so therefore from after that council we see the flourishing mm -hmm. of the, the idea of the Theotokos and that whole Christological imagery which you then so beautifully analysed. So you. thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this is actually what um, you know, we're hoping to explore in our new project is, yeah. is pushing the discussion back to the 7th or 8th century mm -hmm. um, and redefining this idea that, you know, was there's the, the book by Maunder that came out, that collected volume, right, the early cult of Mary, and it stops at 431, and that was really kind of the driving force for this particular research was, okay, that's fine, you've got the historian controversy in, in the Council of Ephesus, but there's nothing coming after it, nothing right? So there, there's nothing, there's no images of Mary that appear really until the 6th and 7th century, so why? And so that, that's sort of the new project is pushing that forward. One last. <laughs> okay, <thank> you. <laughs> I, I just want to mention two things. First of all, that your research um, uh, comes to a sharp contradiction to the theories of Stephen Shoemaker, who places the, uh, cult, uh, the emergence of the uh, uh, Marian cult in the second century or even earlier anyway. So I think that it is, uh, it is certainly something to be reconsidered. And the second uh, is that I would like to ask you whether we um, have parallel developments of the iconography of the crucifixion. 
if you have come across images of the crucifixion in these early centuries? Not from Egypt, because Mary doesn't appear in them, <laughs> at least in the wall paintings. Okay. But I have been single-mindedly focused on sure, the Virgin. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if it wasn't on the Virgin, wasn't on the page, I didn't look at it. Okay. Um, but you, from what I've seen, it's a little bit of a later development in Egypt, and don't quote me on this, I'm going to have to go back right. and look this okay, up. Okay. Um, but it seems to be later, the, the emergence of the cross. Okay. Um, the earliest iconography is, is saints. Um, other important saints, other yeah. than Mary, yeah. St. George, etc. Um, but the cross, I think I know one 6th century example, and that comes from a, a liturgical cross. <coughs> All right. And of course, the reason why I'm asking that is because Cyril of Alexandria uh, puts emphasis on, on the term Theotokos and on the paradox that uh, God pro died uh, at the crucifixion. Yeah. So I, I thought that perhaps in Egypt we could have, uh, you know, parallel uh, developments in these two yeah. themes. Not that I've seen. Well, but thank you very much for a wonderful paper. We really enjoyed it. Thank yes, you. Yes, we'd like to thank you again uh, for your paper. It certainly put me in new areas. <laughs> 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 Even life in a career. ideas, <laughs> and we uh, look forward to your uh, future uh, research here and your other projects which you have mentioned. We know some of them, but obviously there are many more out there. And um, th I want to remind you before we break for the reception that uh, Professor Bartos lectures in two weeks. Uh, we go back to the 5th century, 5th, uh, 4th century, so we're back into known territory, but I think also unknown topics in known territory. We look forward to that. And for our uh, reception to take place, you all have to stand up in the Canadian way, close your folding chair, put them against the bookshelf yes. so we can open up the space. And, uh, yeah.